So my sister, Abby, worked at a daycare center during college. And during her weekly calls home, she would regale me with tales of the kids. My favorites were about a very sweet-seeming 18-month-old named Arlen. Arlen was incredibly bright and incredibly verbal. At 18 months, Arlen spoke more like a five-year-old and was apparently forever musing about the curious goings-on of the daycare. He had a habit of posing what he thought were ridiculous rhetorical questions and then walking off chuckling to himself. Why, he would ask, would Jacob spend so much time building a block structure and then knock it down? <laughs> my sister was out on the playground with him one morning when he posed my favorite of his rhetorical questions. There was a plane flying way overhead. It was so far up in the sky that it was barely visible. Arlen looked up from his play in the sandbox, peered into the sky, and shook his head in amusement. Would you take a look at that, he said. Why would anyone make a plane that small, Miss Abby? <laughs> Arlen's verbal skills were apparently far more developed than his depth perception. <laughs> The plane did not appear small to Arlen because it was far away. At Arlen's visual developmental stage, the plane to him was just really, really tiny. Depth perception, the ability to perceive the relative distance of objects in one's visual field. In my own experience, Easter is the plane flying high overhead in my spiritual development. It is the challenge to my depth perception. Let me tell you what I mean by this. There are two moments in time I most often contemplate at Easter, and one leads to the other. The first is way back at Jesus' actual death and resurrection, to what he might have been feeling throughout his death, to what his body might have looked like once risen to whether his very physical, earthly connection to his disciples continued in some way for him even once he ascended to heaven. My time contemplating the events of the year 33 then leads me into the future to, hopefully far from now, my own death and what parallels to Jesus's I might be able to expect. What will happen to me after I die? Will my actual body be resurrected? Will I be eternally conscious of my loved ones and their experiences in some way? In these ways in which I most often connect to Easter, the relative distance of it in my visual spiritual field is way far off something that either happened long, long ago to someone else, or something that will happen to me, but very much later. But I have been given, as I have been given the privilege of preaching and really sitting with these texts, of witnessing to the flights your own lives have taken and our communal life has taken, I have come to see that my depth perception is not really any better than Arlen's. The truth that has hit me forcefully this Holy Week is that Jesus' resurrection is not principally about long ago or later. It is about now. It is about still. What was once warning is now promise. Object in mirror is closer than it appears. The promise of Easter, actually, not the promise. The present reality of Easter is that the personified, embodied, intimate love made known to us through God's living as one of us, engaging fully in the complications of human relationship as human person, is presently available. Even Jesus' death has not broken the availability of this new form of relationship with God. My eyes
eyes had always been on Jesus' reality in the resurrection, his bodily form, his level of consciousness, his eternal life with God, as models for what would happen to me. But focusing only on Jesus' reality has led me to completely overlook Mary's reality. Mary has also experienced death. It is not her own physical death, but certainly she has experienced death in losing her beloved teacher, guide, and friend to his death. Death is like this. As so many of you know, it never just happens to the one whose physical body dies. It happens to all those who have loved that person, whose reality has been altered by the interconnectedness that always blossoms in loving relationship. So too, for resurrection. Among the most liberating gifts of Easter is that resurrection is not made available only to the one whose body has died, but to those whose anxiety, numbness, and grief at that death seems all that is left. Jesus' resurrection does not just happen to him that first Easter morning, but also, as we heard, to Mary. He appears first to her, speaking to her, comforting her, revealing that the personal, embodied, intimate love of God that Jesus had manifested while alive is still available, even after his death. And because he first appears to Mary, among those most aggrieved by Jesus' death, he reveals that the first priority of the eternal, intimate love of God will continue to be those most injured by the violence of life. Mary's resurrection experience is that the promise that Jesus had embodied in his life and in his crucifixion, the promise that God's love is available through all things, even death, is indeed an eternal, unbreakable truth. We have all experienced death, either the physical death of a loved one or the figurative emotional death of someone close to us or perhaps even ourselves. And I would bet that most of us have also experienced the presence of God's personified love in the midst of that in the embrace of a family member or friend, in a fleeting mountaintop moment where we knew for just a second that we were enough or would be okay or would eventually feel something again. Most of us have, therefore, experienced resurrection. Even when we think of resurrection metaphorically, we so often view it as later, as something we need to wait for. Once we have the new job, or get through this health crisis, or earn our one year sober medallion, or move to the tranquility of the lakefront, we will experience that feeling of new life. But what Mary's resurrection experience promises us is that resurrection is now, moments of hope, and urgent joy are available now in our stressful current job, in our poor health, in the downward spiral of our addiction, in our fast-paced lives. Jesus' death and resurrection do not promise that death will not happen. Death will happen, and it will be hard and sad and scary. But in the midst of it, and afterwards, God's intimate relationship with us remains. God's love in a form that actually physically comforts our human selves, inquires as to how we are and what we are looking for, speaks our name out loud. Mary's Easter resurrection experience ripples throughout her community its touch ever widening even today, to this moment. Jesus' resurrection experience becomes Mary's, becomes the disciples, 
becomes all those whom their resurrection transforms, dominoes throughout space and time such that resurrection is not ever about one person or even two, but ultimately about all of us, right here, right now. May the soothing, gentle, life-giving, courage-inducing presence of God's personal love touch us all on this day and evermore. For indeed, resurrection is closer than it appears. Amen.